Good evening, welcome. My name is Joe Capizzi. I'm the Executive Director of the Institute for Human Ecology at the Catholic University of America. And I just wanna thank you for joining us tonight for a really exciting event that we've put together for you in partnership with the wonderful people at the National Catholic Partnership on Disability. Working with them is one of my favorite uh, partnerships that we have here at the IHE. So I'm just, you know, deeply, deeply excited uh, that we'll be able to join them tonight uh, in presenting a conversation between two wonderful theologians, Miguel Romero and Paul Gundro. Tonight, Miguel will present a paper, an essay that he's written on moral theology, Thomas Aquinas and the question of disability. Paul will respond to his, his paper. And then after that, we'll have questions and comments from you and from me. And we'll have a nice conversation. The Institute for Human Ecology at the Catholic University of America is the nation's leading institute devoted to increasing understanding of the economic, social, and cultural conditions necessary to human flourishing. And our partner this evening, the National Catholic Partnership on Disability, works collaboratively to ensure meaningful participation of persons with disabilities in church and society. Just a quick note about our, our, our relationship with uh, the NCPD, which now has gone on to, a, I think it's our, this is our fourth collaboration with them and we're really, really pleased about this. Part of what we're striving to do together is really to sort of bring out the fullness of the church's teaching on human persons. Uh, and that fullness of course includes people with disabilities. According to John Paul II, the starting point for every reflection on disability is rooted in the fundamental convictions of Christian anthropology. And he added, the quality of life in a community is measured largely by its commitment to assist the weaker and needier members with respect for their dignity as men and women. Our collaboration, we understand, is only a small step in expressing this truth, that people with disabilities are not a special class but instead, like all of us, signs of the unlimited abundance of, God, of expressions of God's image and likeness. Too often, we treat people with disabilities as people apart from the rest of us. But our work with the NCPD strives to undo this deeply mistaken perspective on the human person. So let me introduce Miguel Romero, and, uh, who will give us this lecture tonight. Miguel is an assistant professor of religious and theological studies at Salve Regina University and an NCPD board member. His writing on moral theology, theological method, and the thought of Thomas Aquinas has appeared in the Thomist, Nova et Vetera, the Journal of Moral Theology, and the National Catholic Bioethics Quarterly. His forthcoming book is entitled Destiny of the Wounded Creature, St. Thomas Aquinas on Disability. We're deeply, deeply pleased to be able to offer this essay, uh, this lecture tonight. So Miguel, thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you, Joe, for that warm introduction. Um, uh, Moral Theology, Thomas Aquinas, <clears throat> and the question of disability. So I want to talk this evening about what we embrace as moral theologians and the effect that embrace may have on what we're able to see and what we're able to understand about the vulnerability of our bodies to impairment, illness, and injury disability broadly construed. As it will probably soon become clear with respect to this particular question, uh, I think St. Thomas Aquinas has uh, much to offer and is certainly a trustworthy guide. So to get us started, I thought it'd be good to kick us off with two quotations, uh, about a paragraph each. Um, both of these are of considerable importance to our topic this evening. And as I see it, each illustrates what's at stake in this new collaboration that we've been developing and forging between NCPD and the Institute for Human Ecology. So the first quotation is from the 1978 pastoral statement of the US Catholic bishops on persons with disabilities. Quote, we call upon people of goodwill to examine their attitudes toward their brothers and sisters with disabilities and to promote their well-being. Prejudice starts with a simple perception of difference. Down through the ages, people have tended to interpret these differences in crude moral terms. Our group is not just different from theirs, it's better in some vague but compelling way. Few of us would admit to being prejudiced against people with disabilities. We bear them no ill will and we don't knowingly seek to abrogate their rights. 
Yet people with disabilities are visibly, sometimes bluntly different from the norm. And we react to this difference. Even if we don't look down upon them, we tend all too often to think of them as somehow apart, not completely one of us. No acts of charity or justice can be of lasting value unless our actions are informed by a sincere and understanding love that penetrates the wall of strangeness and affirms the common humanity underlying all distinction, end quote. The second quotation that I have is from the revised guidelines for the celebration of the sacraments with persons who have a disability. This was issued or reissued in uh, 2017 by the U.S. Uh, Catholic bishops. Quote, Catholics with disabilities, as well as those who minister to or with them, often point out that pastoral practice with regard to the celebration of the sacraments varies greatly from diocese to diocese, even from parish to parish. The inconsistencies in pastoral practice often arise from distinct yet overlapping causes. Some result from a misunderstanding about the nature of disabilities. Others arise from an uncertainty about the appropriate application of church law towards persons with disabilities. Others are born out of fear, misunderstanding, or unfamiliarity. These guidelines draw upon the church's ritual books, its canonical tradition, and its experience in ministry in order to dispel misunderstandings that may impede sound pastoral practice in the celebration of the sacraments, end quote. So what do we have here? <clears throat> we have two statements highlighting two problems. In both cases, we have a proposal that what one is able to see and what one is able to understand begins with a kind of embrace. Now, the problem highlighted in the 1978 pastoral statement concerns the way our cultural context informs the way we see. For all of us, it begins with the honest recognition of some kind of difference, but then that honest, dif that honest recognition is interpreted or understood by way of a contrived, patently unchristian norm. From the Christian perspective, it would be a false norm, one which leads us to misperceive ordinary difference as deviant strangeness to misperceive an accidental lack of some relative good as the privation of a substantial quality. It's a contrived norm taken to be stipulative of nature, which can cause a morally vicious tendency of thought according to which the humanity of a person could be questioned. As the bishops said, to think of persons who have a disability as somehow apart, not completely one of us. The other problem identified in the 2017 Revised Sacramental Guidelines has to do with the intellectual formation of pastoral and diocesan ministers. Specifically, inconsistencies in pastoral practice are attributed to discrete points of ignorance, misunderstandings, uncertainties, and a lack of familiarity concerning basic doctrinal, theological, canonical, and liturgical knowledge, and baseless fears arising from poor cultural formation. Now, the U.S. bishops are making a subtle but very important point here, one that seems, uh, as, as I see it, to be inspired by uh, Part 1, Chapter 4 of Gaudi et Spes, uh, for those of you taking notes, and, and the way Pope uh, St. John Paul II frames the practical consequences of inadequate catechesis in Evangelium Vitae. In essence, the problem isn't a lack having to do with some esoteric knowledge or specialized practical training. Rather, the problem has to do with a lack of understanding related to fundamental dogmatic and doctrinal principles, knowledge of church law, church practices, or a failure to be formed in the aesthetic judgments of the Christian intellectual tradition. So the corrective isn't about adding something to the theological curriculum. Rather, it's about getting back to the basics, embracing the faith of the church, sound theology, and correcting problematic ways of thinking about disability that we pick up from contemporary culture. So what is that contemporary cultural context? Well, it entails ways of seeing and ways of thinking, both of which arise from judgments about who and what we embrace. Throughout Western culture and in some corners of Christianity, an ideology of autonomy is promoted that makes an idol out of strength. 
It's generally presumed in Western culture that a fully human and flourishing human life means freedom from need, freedom from limits, freedom from history, and freedom from nature. Now, we're all familiar with the ways this modern ideology of autonomy is manifest in the social sphere. The lives of inconvenient persons are, are snuffed out. The poor are exploited. The weak are abused. And people who are impaired, ill, and aged are met with indifference. Now, what Christians sometimes overlook and Christian theologians sometimes overlook is how that ideology of autonomy can seep into our everyday descriptions of the human good human happiness, and the practices of Christian discipleship. The false freedom of autonomy casts a golden caricature of strength as the measure of man. It is a rationalistic, best-case anthropology that presents human flourishing as a life unfettered by the inconveniences of the body, the inconveniences of family, of culture, of community, and of tradition. When strength and independence are idolized, Conditions like vulnerability and frailty and dependency, these are not accepted as part of what it means to be a human being. Rather, vulnerability and dependency are taken to be defects, evidence of a corrupt or unfulfilled existence. When strengths are idle, the normal human being is not impaired or infirm. Rather, normal humanity, natural humanity, is a splendid and imaginary ideal of carnal integrity, proportion, agility, and comeliness. Now, let's take a step back from that context and take the diagnosis and descriptions framed out by those two documents as prompts for a reflection on the work of moral theology. Now, I think this is the kind of inquiry, this kind of inquiry reflects what is most radical about the collaboration between NCPD and the Institute for Human Ecology. So moral theology. So I'd like for us to think about the way we moral theologians think about the human body. In particular, the goodness and beauty of our fragile flesh. Thinking about these matters is important for contemporary moral theologians, given our common tendency to regard the fragility of our flesh as neither good nor beautiful. A tendency following the US Catholic Conference of Bishops that could be attributed to inadequate catechesis and the various ways our seeing is affected by our cultural milieu. Now the recognition that we are composite creatures to think about the teachings of the church, the recognition that we are composite creatures, a spiritual and corporeal unity, this is basic to the Christian understanding of the human being. For that reason, Christian doctrine on our integral dignity has always included an affirmation of the goodness of the human body. And likewise, the Christian account of the human being has always included an affirmation that the innate vulnerability of our bodies coincides with the harmony of our specific place in the good order of God's creation. In other words, uh, Christians believe that the vulnerability and coordinate dependencies of the human body are essential creaturely goods, enduring aspects of our original nakedness, which are not in themselves the cause for shame. Those gifts are among the natural goods that predicate our, that predicate our, high, our greatest good and final perfection as incarnate intellectual creatures formed in the image and likeness of the triune God. Now, this distinctively Christian understanding of human nature and human dignity, it flows directly from the good news of God's love for the world revealed in and through Jesus Christ. In other words, Christian theological anthropology is regulated by Christian belief in the origin, history, status, and destiny of the human being amid the ongoing act of creation. Considered by way of that revealed history, the various post-lapsarian disclosures of our innate vulnerability, these are rightly regarded as privations of a corporeal good. However, those defects or infirmities, we might call them, these defects and infirmities, they cannot diminish our incarnate creaturely dignity, and they, they can't displace the fittingness of our composite nature. Rather, in the light of the gospel, as discussed below, and following St. Thomas Aquinas, these defects and infirmities of the human body, they manifest something. They manifest something of the goodness of corporeality 
and the fitting beauty of our fragile flesh. Now, the Christian affirmation of our specifically incarnate intellectual dignity and the fittingness of our vulnerability and the enduring, as and the enduring goodness of corporeality, these three doctrines, these function as something like anthropological principles for distinctively Christian theological consideration of the integral good proper to the human being. So with, with that in mind, the, the two quotations uh, we've taken as our prompt, they indicate a somewhat consistent reoccurring tendency to avoid or to muddle this constellation of principles. It is worth considering uh, what it looks like in moral theological and, uh, and Christian ethical discourse. For example, and I think some of you will recognize some of these, in some quarters of Christian theology, the suggestion that our corporeal vulnerability is an essential and fitting creaturely good, that claim might be regarded as inconsistent with Christian doctrine on original sin and the consequences of the fall. Supposing from that quarter that the vulnerability of our bodies to external effects is a primeval curse which corrupts human nature and undermines human dignity. In other quarters of Christian theology, to mention evil or sin or defect in relation to bodily impairment, illness, injury, or disability, that might be regarded as having elitist and uh, chauvinistic, if not dangerously eugenic implications that threaten to undermine the dignity of persons who have some kind of impairment. Supposing uh, from that quarter that the Christian affirmation of our inalienable dignity remains intelligible when abstracted from the particulars of the gospel. So we have a tension there, and that's something of a problem. Now, the breadth and depth of this contemporary problem is struck in high relief when we consider how the topic of disability, and I'm using square, scare quotes there, how the topic of disability is theologically conceived and navigated, engaged and avoided in contemporary Catholic systematic, moral, and ethical discourse. And we can think about a solution. And clues, clues toward a solution to this particular kind of problem can be found in sections 46 through 50 of Pope St. John Paul's encyclical Veritatis Splendor. So I, I'm not going to read the relevant sections now. Uh, you can write them down. But in those sections, uh, Pope John Paul addresses certain problematic moral methodologies. And the correctives proposed by Pope John Paul are a recovery of and a return to fundamental dogmatic and doctrinal principles. Now, considering the two quarters of Christian theology that I just noted, a way forward, listening, attending to Pope John Paul could look like this. On the one hand, any theological account of the human good and human happiness is incomplete if it does not and cannot account for how that life is possible for the kind of beings that we are, intellectual creatures, composite beings formed in the image and likeness of God, but beings who are by nature, among other things, variously and equally vulnerable to impairment, illness, and injury. And on the other hand, any Christian ethical or practical pastoral engagement with the facts of, of impairment, illness, and injury in the life of the church, that's incomplete. If it does not, and cannot account for the outlook held how how the how for how the outlook held forth how it coheres with the basic doctrines of Christian faith, including among among other things Christian doctrine on our specific intellectual dignity, the goodness of corporeality, uh, 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 the doctrine of original sin, and the corporeal consequences of the fall. So with the remainder of our time, I want to explore these problems, and I want to explore these possibilities, the path forward proposed by Pope John Paul. So I'm going to do three things. Uh, first, I, I'm going to give a quick sketch uh, of a typology. Um, I like typologies, even if they're only useful for like a minute. I'm going to sketch a quick typology uh, covering three common contemporary ways of approaching the topic of disability. Second, I, I, I'm going to turn to the resource we have in the theology of St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, and the third, drawing upon St. Thomas, um, I'm going to consider 
one key contemporary theological muddle related to the doctrine of original sin and the way moral theologians think about the vulnerability of the human body. And then uh, if, uh, I'll conclude with some general comments on a, on a particular kind of corrective, a uh, path for conversion, a particular kind of embrace that might be called for among contemporary moral theologians. So first, my typology. Uh, uh, first, a typology of common contemporary theological approaches to disability. So what's my goal with this? So the goal here is, is, is just to map a symptom, to map this symptom on the understanding that, that the symptom will give us some kind of insight into the, to the underlying cause. So the symptom is the various ways theologians conceive and navigate, engage, or avoid the topic of disability. The underlying cause, the thing that I think really interests uh, me and, and concerns us here, the underlying cause is the predicate judgments of the theologian on core anthropological principles, like the ones I mentioned above. So it could be said that there are basically or roughly three ways contemporary theologians navigate uh, the, the topic of disability. The first could be called principled avoidance. So some theologians, moralists and ethicists, you know, they intentionally avoid the topic of disability. You know, not necessarily because they think it's unimportant or there's something wrong with it. It's just simply not what they do. It's not among their special interests because it is a special interest concern. We could contrast that with a slightly different but related approach, which we might call practical specialization. Now, these are theologians, moralists, and ethicists who specially devoted their theological expertise, practical wisdom, and ecclesial knowledge toward addressing particular practical challenges that, uh, that face persons who have a disability. And their interest is inspiring the faith of Christians whose lives are, lives are somehow affected by disability. Now, for both the, the principled avoider and the practical specialist, Christian discourse on the the anthropological significance and moral implications of disability, it tends to be regarded as a practice-oriented accessory extension of standard Christian theology, not something that belongs to fundamental theology or systematic theology. And we can see, we can imagine a third approach to disability that's out there. Uh, I, I, I would describe it as instrumental use. Uh, in recent decades, a loosely affiliated network of theologians has emerged to recognize how the reality and experience of disability can be used instrumentally to expose and explore certain conceptual problems and disciplinary blind, blind spots in systematic theology and moral theology and theorizing around uh, practical Christian responses to the needs of particular persons. So most academic writing that falls under the heading theology and disability or theology of disability would fit into the generic framework of the instrumental use type. So we have three that I just mapped, principled avo avoider, uh, practical specialist, and instrumental use. So here's what's interesting about those ways of conceiving and navigating disability. Woven into the three modes of engagement in different ways and to different degrees are a number of presumptions related to the very concept of disability. Presumptions about this concept of disability that we have been appropriated from wider culture. For example, and these express themselves different, uh, differently in, in different degrees. Uh, for example, the presumption that the ability, disability distinction, that this is a self-evident and unproblematic natural division of humanity. Or the presumption that the concept disability can function as an internally coherent, conceptually stable, all historical category, an apotheosis of the concept. Or the presumption that, Christian the, that the Christian theological tradition holds impairment, illness, and injury, my disability, to be unequivocally bad, objectively ugly, and definitively tragic corporeal states. Now, what's important to understand about these particular presumptions about disability is that none of them are really sustainable when subjected to philosophically serious theological scrutiny. These ways of seeing and these fundamental misunderstandings 
underwrite a theologically unfounded confidence in the nature, meaning, and valuation of the very concept of disability. And this is true for those of us who intentionally engage the topic of disability and those of us who intentionally avoid the topic of disability. So in, in other words, most of us have inherited, in, inherited in, in one way or another aesthetic judgments about disability from wider culture. And we've picked up imprecise disability-related doctrinal, theological, and sociological formula. Now, I take this to be along the lines of the diagnosis and descriptions framed out by the U.S. Catholic bishops in the 1978 pastoral statement and in the 2017 revised sacramental guidelines. Now, taken in the aggregate, there is a juicy and suggestive parallel here between this circumstance among contemporary moral theologians and Alistair McIntyre's assessment of late 20th century moral philosophy in his book, Dependent Rational Animals. Now, I would love to go down that path. It's wonderful to talk about and very interesting. Maybe if someone's interested along those lines, we can talk about it, but I'm not going to do that here. Now, the way we engage or avoid the topic of disability can help us recognize deeper problems in the way we approach our work as moral theologians. So having all too briefly mapped the problem, I'd like to turn our attention to St. Thomas Aquinas and his account of the goodness and beauty of our fragile flesh in question 91, article three of the Prima Pars, which concerns both ways of seeing and ways of thinking. Now, I am convinced that the thought of Aquinas provides the most promising point from which to retrace our modern conceptual and interpretive errors related to the concept disability. So Aquinas and the question of disability. So to, to orient us in broad terms, uh, I'll paint with a broad brush. Uh, Aquinas remarks on the defects and infirmities of the human body, including persons who lack the use of reason. These are peppered throughout each of his commentaries and in all of his major theological works. It just shows up regularly and consistently. Now, from the Christian perspective, these themes are hardly esoteric to beings with bodies, composite beings like us. And these, uh, these themes are certainly not alien to the thought of Thomas Aquinas. What we find in Aquinas' work on these themes is integrated into the whole of his thought. Uh, of particular relevance to contemporary theological engagement with, with disability, Aquinas' doctrine of creation, his theological anthropology, his moral theology, his sacramental theology, these all presume the ordinary fact that sometimes we human beings are found to have impairments, illnesses, and injuries of various degrees and for various lengths of time, sometimes permanent uh, uh, impairments, illnesses, and injuries. So uh, what does it mean to be a human being, according to St. Thomas? Well, first of all, we are creatures. You got to start there. Creatures, uh, uh, creatures formed in the image and likeness of our creator, lovingly sustained in the ongoing creative act of the God who is the primal origin of all things. We are intellectual creatures, uh, uh, an incorruptible rational soul existing in and through a corruptible body as the spiritual principle, the form of that body. We are sensual beings, sensual beings whose incarnate natural happiness includes the knowledge and love of immaterial truth and goodness alive in the image of our creator. And we're beings that can be capacitated by supernatural grace to know and love the triune God, the perfection of goodness, truth, and beauty, uh, our ultimate happiness, the happiness toward, for which we hunger. And yet, we are fragile and vulnerable beings, rational animals whose creaturely freedom is forged in the dynamic intercourse of our creaturely limitation, beings called to holiness and virtue, and who remain as yet burdened by the corporeal wounds of original sin. Now, Aquinas' understanding of the human condition reflects what the church receives in St. Paul's letter to the Romans. Although our bodies are subject to infirmity and death because of sin, through Christ we are healed. And from the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit is given to strengthen us wayfarers, helping us in our weakness, interceding for us and through us in wordless groans to the Father. 
So physically burdened, distressed, and weighed down by decay, God's elect are called justified and purposed for glory because nothing in creation can separate us from the love of God in Christ. This limitation and this weakness is where Christ meets us. This is what Aquinas reminds us. Christ meets us here so that we might be healed and restored in friendship with the Creator, supernaturally strengthened in this life for holiness and a spiritual progress toward our twofold end, moral virtue and the contemplative beatific vision of divine glory. So now that we have that quick snapshot, let's turn to Aquinas's Summa. Question 91, Article 3 of the Prima Pars. This is an interesting article. Aquinas's treatment of the fittingness of our, of our corporeal vulnerabilities and dependencies, it appears at the beginning of the second half of his treatise on the human being. Now, it's important to note that this article is not an accessory digression from the main thrust of Aquinas's discussion. Rather, the question is situated at the absolute heart of Aquinas' theological account of the human being. For that reason, the organizing puzzle of, of Article 3, it drops with a bone-shaking thud. It drops with a bone-shaking thud, cold in its simplicity and nauseating in its implications. It was seen that the body of man was not given an apt disposition. It would seem that the body of man was not given an apt disposition. To be clear, the question is not, what is the disposition of the human body? Aquinas has already answered that question. Uh, he, he did that in, in question 76. Um, the incorruptible intellectual soul is united with a corruptible body, an instrument well suited to a, create, a creature that learns by way of sensation. That's what he does in 76. Rather, in question, uh, in, in question 91, Article 3, the question there is, what are we to think about the human body in light of the gospel? Specifically, is the vulnerability of our bodies good and fitting, appropriate to the creaturely dignity and graced destiny of the human being? So for those who are able to ask this question with St. Thomas, one need only to stand naked before a mirror or to pause after bathing to feel its force. We examine the lumpy, scarred, misshaped, and inglorious bodies that we have. And we know, we know the frail, weak, and leaky and deformed truth of our corporeality. Aquinas does not pull back from this question. He doesn't pull back, he embraces the question. The three objections he entertains press some of the most basic distinguishing concerns of any coherently Christian account of our vulnerability to impairment, illness, and injury. Did God make a mistake in giving us bodies that are vulnerable? Does the vulnerability and weakness of our bodies diminish our dignity as intellectual creatures? Do the impairments, illnesses, and disorders of my body signal my disqualification from God's providential intent for the human being? These questions, these kinds of questions, shine a light on many of the most precious conceits and hidden shames that we bear in regard to our own body our own particular body, because when we look in the mirror and we pause after bathing, considering our bodies as they actually are, it is unnervingly easy to consider with Aquinas the possibility that God may have made a mistake. Did God make a mistake? So what does Aquinas say? What does Aquinas say to that? Aquinas <clears throat> he begins his response by reframing the question about the goodness and fittingness of the human body. He reframes the, 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 the entire question and flips it on its, its head with an appeal to the artistry of creator God. This is what he writes, quote, all natural things were produced by the divine art, 
and so may be called work, God's works of art. Now, every artist intends to give his work the best disposition, not absolutely the best, but the best as regards the proposed end. And even if this entails some defect, the artist doesn't fret. Artifacts non curat. He doesn't worry. He doesn't stress out. So to illustrate this appeal to the creator, Aquinas gives the example of an artisan making a saw. This is what he writes, quote, when a man makes himself a saw for the purpose of cutting, he makes it out of iron, which is suitable for the object in view. And he doesn't prefer to make it out of glass, though this would be a more beautiful material because the very beauty of glass would be an obstacle to the end that the artist has in view for the saw, end quote. So what do we do with that? What, is, what does it have to do with the question? Did God make us a mistake? Did, uh, uh, it, it was, it, it was the human body given an apt disposition? Well, fortunately, the anthropological implications of Aquinas' saw analogy, they don't require speculative leaps or interpretive stretches. Aquinas immediately makes the implications explicit. He does this a lot, and I like that about Aquinas. This is what he writes. He wrote, quote, God gave to each natural being the best disposition. Not absolutely so, but in view of its proper end. Now, the proximate end of the human body is the rational soul and its operations. Now, since matter is for the sake of form and instruments are for the action of the agent, I say, therefore, that God fashioned the human body in that disposition which was best, befitting to such a form and to such operations, end quote. So what's going on here? What is he saying? Well, we can understand it like this. Thomas is concerned to reconcile the innate vulnerability of the human body to defect with the Christian belief, with the Christian presumption that the human being, a composite creature, that we have an honored place in the good order of God's creation. The reason this argument needs to be made surely has something to do with a tendency, the tendency to regard the defects of our bodies and the bodies of others as repulsive, as ugly, as unfitting, unnatural. In other words, the argument needs to be made because many of us have a tendency to regard our vulnerability to impairment, illness, and injury as an unnatural and ugly aspect of the human condition. So when it comes to the defects of the human body, Aquinas challenges Christians to understand, to attend to, and appropriate the practical insight and intent of the architect of creation, the master artisan. Now, there's a nuance here that uh, is worth mentioning. As a matter of aesthetics, specifically theological aesthetics, integrity, proportionality, and clarity. Now, the integral perfection of a particular human being is not indexed in Aquinas' account. Uh, is not indexed solely to his or her status as an intellectual creature. Rather, her or his integral perfection is indexed to the actualized intent of the creator. Aquinas calls this the first perfection of the human being. Now, coordinate with that, uh, the proportionality or fittingness of a particular human being is not indexed solely to the transient splendors and, or corruptions of other bodies. Rather, the fittingness is indexed to the final end purposed by the creator, exemplified in the resurrection glory of Christ's scarred body. So for Aquinas, the creator's ultimate intent for the human being is a perfection in contemplation that cannot be frustrated by bodily defect. Aquinas calls this the final perfection of the human being. So, for Aquinas, when it comes to the Christian account of the human being, there is no more determinative argument or theory or framework than the bedrock of our faith and the providential goodness of the creator. And it would also seem that for Aquinas, there is no more determinative argument or theory or framework uh, for the determination of the fittingness 
of our vulnerability than our faith in the providential goodness of the creator. Now, Aquinas acknowledges that we have a tendency to see some bodies as beautiful and others as ugly. But at the center of his treatise on the human being, he lays out a theological framework for describing and recognizing a beauty that one must learn to see. Just as the apprentice would need to learn to apprehend and discern from a master craftsman. But Aquinas gives us more than that. Aquinas gives a solid footing to address a common contemporary muddle related to original sin and our experience of impairment, illness, and injury. So here's this theological muddle that Aquinas helps us with. There's, there's a common view that our actual vulnerability to corporeal defect and infirmity is an original sin-caused privation of a natural good that's actually due to the human being. Now, so parts of this are going to be a, a bit technical, so, so I'll keep it brief. And if some of the terms are unfamiliar, uh, you can just hang on to the basic idea. Here's the basic idea. I'm essentially using the thought of Aquinas to show how a eugenic mentality has snaked its way into the thought of some contemporary moral theologians. So I'm concerned here with the, a distorted view of our innate creaturely perfection which in turn leads to a distorted view of the anthropological significance of impairment, illness, and injury, or disability. Specifically, some contemporary theologians presume an idealized caricature of the human being and the development of their moral reflections on the human good. They, presupp they presuppose a picture of human perfection that deliberately excludes vulnerability and dependency. So uh, if you're taking notes, and if it helps to set a baseline, Aquinas discusses this in, in question 48, articles four and six of the Prima Pars. And he also does, picks this up in Demalo, question four, article two, question five, articles four through five. In those places, it all boils down on this particular topic or point, it all boils down to a failure to distinguish between the wound of original sin and the consequences of original sin. So what's the situation, the contemporary situation? In some quarters of contemporary Christian theological discourse, there's a common conceptual shorthand that conflates the spiritual wound of original sin with the corporeal consequences of original sin. Now that shorthand is then refracted through the various offense penalty metaphors that we find throughout scripture and the tradition. So the problem, of course, is not the Pauline rubric of death and disease as consequence of sin. Um, rather, the problem develops when modern theologians, reasoning in the wake of modern biomedicine and the eugenics movement of the, uh, of the late 19th and early 20th century, the problem occurs when mo modern theologians amplify the offense penalty metaphor beyond Paul's own circumscribed use. So when developed, this problematic way of thinking, it transposes the lack of a relative corporeal good, like sight or hearing, from an accidental bodily impairment to an essential perversion of human nature. So the theological move looks like this. The natural vulnerability of the human body is collapsed into the various privations we experience in our bodies consequence, as a consequence of original sin as if the human being is naturally invulnerable and naturally self-sufficient and is now found in a sin-wrecked state of unnatural vulnerability and unnatural dependency. In other words, it's supposed that a vulnerable human body lacks a good proper to the human being that is the allegedly natural good of being invulnerable to impairment, illness, and injury. So understood in that way, our naturally vulnerable and dependent nature is reckoned to be a perversion that's fundamentally opposed to the human good and human happiness. Specifically, the natural, uh, the natural qualities are reframed as quasi-moral dispositional disorders that need to be overcome in order to progress toward the good of our life in Christ. Now, what this distortion of the Christian view implies is that privation of any corporeal good amounts to a correlative privation 
of the goodness of corporeality. I'll say that again. What this distortion of the Christian view implies is that a privation of any corporeal good amounts to a correlative privation of the goodness of corporeality. In plain terms, this unchristian way of thinking about original sin in relation to our vulnerability is sees things like this. Healthy, strong, and mature bodies, these are natural bodies, and therefore good bodies, more perfect actualizations of the integral dignity of the human being. Infirm, weak, immature, and or aged bodies, these are unnatural bodies, and therefore bad bodies, less perfect actualizations of the dignity of the human being. And it follows from this view that persons whose bodies are free from corporeal defect are better able to realize the specific good of the human being in the good order of God's creation. And that persons whose bodies have some defect are less able to realize the specific good of the human being in creation. Now, this is a problem, at least for Aquinas, because according to Aquinas, the final contemplative good of the human being is in that way subordinated to the goods of the body. That conclusion, if we're thinking with Aquinas, is inconsistent with the traditional Christian account of our specifically incarnate intellectual dignity, the fittingness of our vulnerability, and the enduring goodness of corporeality. St. Thomas helps us understand precisely why and how this eugenic mentality is irreconcilable with the teachings of the Catholic Church. So, uh, a conclusion, uh, a concluding point about embrace and encounter and uh, the process of learning to see. Receiving the fullness of the Christian account of our innate vulnerability is not merely a matter of collecting theological reminders and arranging anthropological principles from the Christian archive. It also involves the formation and habituation of our aesthetic sensibilities, our, uh, our ability to see. Now, I want to suggest that the formal coherence and precision of any particular Catholic moral theologian's interpretive and speculative work um, can be refined through a discipline of moral conversion. A discipline of moral conversion that happens by way of encounter and embrace which will enable the transformation of one's affective inclination. It'll allow one to see differently. Thinking with Aquinas, it would be an apprenticeship at the feet of the master craftsman, the creator of vulnerable creatures like us, in order to learn to see the beauty that the creator sees. Now, this is a different way of thinking about beauty, because to hold forth that our fragile flesh is good and beautiful, just as we affirm the beauty of Christ's passion and the cross, this is to lay claim to a distinctively Christian vision of beauty and uh, uh, to the kind of formation that allows us to even recognize that kind of beauty. It's a skill of aesthetic perception, a way of seeing. This skill is illustrated in the in, in the transformation, for example, and the conversion experienced by St. Francis of Assisi. You will recall that story, I won't recount it here, but uh, for St. Francis, what before had been bitter, that is to see and to touch lepers, was turned into sweetness. We can ask ourselves, what exactly did St. Francis see? Did St. Francis undergo a, 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 a bizarre distortion of a sensory experience of the world? such that truly revolting sights and revolting smells were deceptively veiled? Or rather, could it be, could it be that Francis simply learned to recognize a goodness and a beauty that's easy to ignore, easy to avoid? I want to suggest the beauty Francis came to apprehend is the innate dignity and fitting purpose of the human being, in particular our vulnerable bodies, in the good order of God's creation. He learned it to see with the eyes of the creator. Now, understood through the lens of Aquinas' sacramental theology, this is, would be one of the ordinary transformations capacitated and offered by Christ to the church in the sacrament of confirmation. 
I have in mind here a kind of affective transformation that's available for every Christian to accept or to reject in response to our own vulnerability and the vulnerability of our neighbors. There stands an invitation, one that prompts a personal response to either touch or withdraw from the beauty eternally revealed in Christ's passion, celebrated in the Eucharist and offered to doubting theologians in the splendor of Christ's glorified wounds. As Jesus said to the Apostle Thomas, Thomas, put your finger here. Now, what difference would it make? What difference would it make if moral theologians if we learn to recognize the goodness and beauty of our fragile flesh from the perspective of the creator? And how might a refusal to learn to see affect our work as moral theologians? And furthermore, considering the path charted for us uh, by St. Thomas Aquinas, how might a refusal to think with theological seriousness about our vulnerability how might that affect the work that we do? Thank you. Thank you very much, Miguel. Paul Gundro teaches and is published widely in the areas of moral theology with an emphasis on human sexuality and marriage, Christology and sacraments, and specializes in the thought of St. Thomas Aquinas. The father of a child with special needs, he has also published on the moral theology of disability. He is currently working on a monograph on a Thomistic account of the meaning and purpose of sexuality. We're uh, deeply grateful that Paul is here to respond to Miguel's excellent talk. Thank you. Thank you. And I wish to thank Professor Romero for his talk. And in my brief response, I'd like to take up his invitation to see, quote, our fragile flesh as good and beautiful, to see how disability, defects, and infirmities of the body what manifests the goodness of the human body and the fitting beauty of our fragile flesh. Disability in its own way manifests the human body as God's artistic masterpiece to reference that marvelous article from the Summa that uh, Professor Romero cited, uh, that's question 91, article three from the first part of the Summa of Theology. In a first move, I wish to point out how common human experience testifies to the fact that frailty and vulnerability touch us at the core of our humanity and thus expose the basic goodness and beauty of human nature. Consider, for instance, how often people are moved at a kind of visceral level, stirred in their very depths by compassion and sympathy when they encounter a person with a disability. I see this every day with my children how they're constantly drawn, truly drawn to my son with cerebral palsy. Or consider how in your everyday experience, when you come upon a friend or an acquaintance and learn that this person is suffering in some acute way and is bearing an oppressive infirmity, you feel stirred deep within and your heart immediately goes out to the person. There is an undeniable experience of a common humanity when there is a human encounter amidst vulnerabilities. Western tradition at its very origins testifies to this common human experience. Consider, for instance, how perhaps the most celebrated scene in all of Homeric literature gives witness to it. I'm speaking of the moment near the end of the Iliad when the elderly and frail great King Priam of Troy, cloaked in secrecy and abject lowliness and exposed in his frailties and vulnerabilities, comes at night to the tent of his arch nemesis Achilles to beg for the dead body of his son Hector, whom Achilles had slain in a vengeful rage. Priam enters the tent of the petulant Achilles, the Achilles whom Homer here describes as, quote, without a shred of decency in his heart, whose temper never bends or changes like some lion going his own barbaric way, a man given to brute force and wild pride and who's lost all pity, end quote. Suddenly, this same Achilles relents and the theretofore arch enemies share a touching human moment. Achilles weeps with Priam when the Trojan king entreats him to remember his own father. 
Remember your own father, great godlike Achilles, says Priam. As old as I am, past the threshold of deadly old age, pity me in my own right. Homer continues, these words stirred within Achilles a deep desire to grieve for his own father. And overpowered by memory, both men gave way to grief. Priam wept freely, and Achilles wept himself. Then Achilles raised the old man by the hand and filled with pity, now for his gray head and gray beard, for his vulnerability and frailty, we might say. He spoke out, poor man, how much you've suffered, pain to break the spirit. Come, let us put our griefs to rest in our own hearts and recall that it is the lot of man to suffer and feel sorrow." End quote. It's as if encountering the vulnerabilities of another moves us to let down our guard, to drop our pretenses, our many layers of makeup, our defenses, our filters, our petulances, and to recognize our own vulnerabilities, to recognize our naked humanity laid bare. There is a visceral sharing of a common humanity precisely on account of the recognition of shared vulnerabilities and weaknesses of shared sufferings. We find the same thing in Virgil, whose great epic Aeneid is anchored in the sufferings and hardships of Aeneas. The opening lines expressly state that Aeneas was made to suffer, quote, to brave such rounds of hardship and to bear such trials, end quote, and that he was defined by his suffering. Because Aeneas was forged by suffering, he can in turn recognize the humanity of a fellow sufferer and of the corresponding need to show mercy even if that fellow sufferer is a Greek, that is an enemy. We find this presented in a wonderful scene in book three where Aeneas and his fellow Trojans adrift at sea approach the island of the Cyclopses and they happen upon a man whom Virgil describes as quote, all but starved to death in wretched condition. The wretched man sees them from the shore and begs for mercy. He begs them to rescue him from the torments, torments of the Cyclopses, though he confesses that he doesn't deserve it since he is a Greek who, quote, fought to seize their household gods. After hearing his story of hardship and suffering, Aeneas extends him a Greek mercy. He takes him aboard as he had, quote, earned his way. Earned it, that is, through his suffering. Again, shared grief gives way to a shared humanity. And yet, for all this common testimony of suffering as a powerful shared human experience, suffering human frailty, impairment, disability, at the same time confound and perplex us. After all, though it be the lot of man to suffer, and though shared griefs might bind us in our common humanity, it begs to be asked, what real meaning is there to be found in suffering? The confounding mystery of suffering is especially the case for our culture, which flees from impairment and suffering, pushing it aside and escaping from it, unable to find any sense and meaning in it. What else, after all, is the ever-increasing demand for assisted suicide expressive of than an inability to find any meaning or dignity in impairment and suffering? We are less the inheritors of Homer and his understanding that it is the lot of man to suffer, and of Virgil in his appreciation that our suffering binds us together in our shared humanity. Instead, we are more the inheritors of Descartes, who both relegated the body and all things associated with it, decay, impairment, frailty, to the category, to the category of the subhuman. Recall Descartes' assertion, quote, the soul is that by which I am what I am, and it is entirely distinct or separate from the body, end quote. And who Descartes considered it within our grasp, quote, this is Descartes, to make ourselves the masters and possessors of nature, so as to be free of innumerable illnesses of the body, and perhaps even the decline of old age, end quote. This view which 
has seeped deep into the well of contemporary thought leads us to have an utterly hostile attitude towards suffering, infirmity, decay, relegated as they are to the subhuman. We must not accept these as our lot, but seek instead to eradicate them from our existence, be free of them, to use Descartes' language. As regards disability then, we are quite uncomfortable with it, since persons with disability stand out as a kind of glaring exclamation point of the frailty, the limitations and vulnerability of the subhuman body. Disability reminds us manifestly that we have yet to attain Descartes' goal of overcoming the illnesses of the body and even death itself. With this hostile attitude toward impairment and disability firmly entrenched, it is a short step to considering persons with disability as themselves subhuman. Thus, the U.S. bishops in their pastoral statement on persons with disabilities quoted at the outset of Prof Professor Marrow's talk. We tend all too often to think of persons with disability as different, as somehow apart, not completely one of us. Now, to be clear, we should recall that Aquinas does point out the paradoxical nature of suffering, impairment, and decay. On the one hand, they are natural to us as owing to our body, which is, as he puts it, composed of contraries. That is, because we own a body given to corruption. On the other hand, suffering, infirmity, and decay belong to the reatus poenae, to the post-lapsarian state of punishment due to sin. Aquinas writes, death and decay are both natural on account of our condition pertaining to matter or to the body and penal on account of the loss of the original divine favor preserving man from death and decay, end quote. Suffering cannot be divorced from the sin of the beginnings, says Pope John Paul II in Salvici Dolores, number 15. The paradox, then, is that suffering, impairment, decay are both natural to us and they signal that our present condition falls short of what God intended for us when he created us and which he endowed our first parents with, the pre privation of certain goods that Professor Romero mentioned. As John Paul II puts it in Salvici Dolores, the human being suffers when he ought in the normal order of things to have a share in this good of his nature and does not have it, end quote. Which brings us to Christ. As Professor Romero observes, Christ comes to meet us in our limitations and weaknesses. Indeed, Christ plums the depths of human frailty, canonically embracing a life of servitude and suffering to the point of even death on a cross to reference the hymn to the Philippians. Like King Priam, Christ comes to us in weakness and vulnerability. He comes cloaked in abject lowliness and frailty. And it is in our own weakness and vulnerability, in our shared griefs, to use the words of Achilles, where we shall meet him. Yes, in King Priam, we see a faint echo of and even aspiration for the kenosis of the incarnation but a quite faint echo and aspiration as Christ's kenosis, his self-emptying fulfills this aspiration in a decisively new and completely unimagined way. Christ is no mere recycled King Priam nor Priam on steroids. No, there is a much greater than King Priam here. Christ comes not to beg for mercy as did Priam, but to grant us mercy. Christ comes not as our enemy, as Priam was Achilles' enemy, but as our brother burning with superabundant charity. Christ comes both to share our griefs and to redeem and transform our griefs, thus giving profound meaning to suffering. Christ alone provides the answer to the riddle and mystery of human suffering, impairment, and decay. In him, the weakness of the human condition receives its full meaning. Christ explodes our understanding of suffering and infirmity, turning them on their head. And he gives us a new vision of beauty, a distinctively Christian vision of beauty, 
as Professor Romero rightly calls it. In a little known address in 2002, Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger observes how beauty itself is transformed and given, quote, new depth and a new realism in the scandal of Christ's cross. He draws this conclusion from the paradoxical fact that though he had no comeliness that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him, Isaiah 53, 2, when he hung upon the cross, Christ remained all the same, and in that very moment on the cross, quote, the fairest of the sons of men, Psalm 45, 2. Christ on the cross reveals a new and higher beauty. What else would explain how it is that we turn the crucifix in itself a hideous display of torture, malice, and cruelty into beautiful artistic displays? And what else would explain why we call the day on which the Lord died Good Friday? I have here uh, this crucifix uh, hanging from my kitchen in our dining room. Uh, it's a Baroque design of the crucifixion. Artistically beautiful crucifixes give their own witness to the fact that in the hideousness of the crucifixion is yet revealed a higher beauty, as well as a higher wisdom and power, despite its face value folly and weakness, to advert to the Pauline notion of the divine folly. Thus, when in his resurrected body, Christ shows the apostles the wounds in his hands and side, he shows them his beauty marks, since by these wounds we are healed, Isaiah 53, 5. And here's the money line. Christ grants us a share in his sufferings, and thus a share in his beauty marks. To express this in terms of disability, disability and human impairment of every sort are a participation in the very same beauty marks of Christ's passion. Indeed, the greater the impairment, the greater the disability, the greater the participation in Christ's beauty marks. This is the new depth and new realism that Christ gives to human suffering. And make no mistake, the wounds of Christ's resurrected body are glorified wounds. As glorified wounds, they have been transformed. They cause him no further pain. They do not cause Christ to suffer repeated death. But they remain in his glorified body because they attest to the redemptive power of Christ's suffering and thus to the redemptive power of all suffering. Christ's wounds remain because they attest to his burning merciful love for a humankind whose lot it is indeed to suffer, but whose suffering shall likewise be glorified and transformed. Our bodies also shall be resurrected and glorified, meaning our fragile flesh shall receive what Aquinas terms an essay incorruptibile, an incorruptible nature. Indeed, the closing prayer from today's Mass prays, quote, that our flesh may attain the incorruptible glory of the resurrection. The marks of our suffering and impairment shall, as in Christ and owing to this essay incorruptibile that awaits, become their own transformed glorified beauty marks. And the greater the suffering, the greater the impairment, the greater the disability, the greater the glorified beauty marks. God founded human nature without defect, just so will he restore it without defect, Aquinas writes. I close on a personal note, observing how I have beheld this new depth and new realism, this new vision of beauty, in my son with cerebral palsy, in my son's own fragile flesh. My son, his name is Dominic, has severe cerebral palsy, which for him means acute and wide-ranging physical, though not cognitive, impairment. He requires assistance for everything, to get dressed, to be displaced, to sit, to eat and drink, to take a shower, to stand, etc. There is not one moment in his life when he has not known the cross. He has only ever known the cross. But the greater the sharing in the cross, the greater the sharing in its beauty. And I can assure you that beauty radiates from Dominic's entire persona, precisely on account of his disability. 
there is an endearing sweetness of soul in him, a joy, a playfulness, a most considerate kindness, a sense of gratitude, a palpable geniality, a deep empathy for others, an innocence, a raw honesty, a simplicity, an indomitable work ethic and determination, a high tolerance for pain and discomfort, a remarkable habit of patience, a brightness in his eyes and face, an infectious smile. I could go on and on. Everything is so raw in Dominic, no pretenses, no filters, no facade, just a naked humanity laid bare amidst his vulnerabilities. Put simply, when I am with Dominic, I feel like I am on holy ground. When I look at his face, I feel like I am beholding the face of God himself. I feel like I am in the presence of God. And why not? Since I am in the presence of the cross. This is difficult to describe and I don't wish it to sound sentimental or put on, but I'm convinced I live with a saint, indeed a great saint. This is the gift of disability a sign in its own way of divine favor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, and thank you, Paul and Miguel, for um, really just wonderful, wonderful talks. There's way more um, than we could possibly discuss in the time we have left. Uh, and it really sort of invites us to do this again in the near future. So rather than me say anything, I'd actually like to go right to the audience questions. Uh, there are just are some wonderful questions. Some of them are you know, the sorts I would have asked myself anyway. So I'm just gonna start with one of them. And Miguel, this one is a, you know, it's a very like specialized question about your typology, right? So just thinking back to your typology, this person asks, can you give an, an example of the two theological approaches um, practical, practical specialization and instrumental use. By the way, I'll probably plead guilty to both of those in my own career. So uh, just you know, just cards on the table. How are these different? The person asks. What's the difference between practical specialty, specialization and instrumental use? Uh, 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 thanks, John, and, and uh, <clears throat> uh, thanks for that question. So, uh, so a confession about the typology, right? So. Uh, uh, typologies are useful for about a minute, right? That they're they're useful because you, they help they help you see and generalize like differences and distinctions. Um, but uh, the good good typologies last, and they and you can really uh, uh, um, you can go deep with them. Uh, uh, but certain kind you can also tune typologies for certain kinds of ends. And so this typology, I was mostly just trying to parse out different ways of navigating the concept of disability. Um, among my concerns was to talk about folks who intentionally avoid it because there are theologians who it's like it's not my thing i don't do that so i'm avoiding it um uh, uh now the distinction between practical specialization um and instrumental use mostly looking at the, at the literature that's out there uh, I, I have an article where i kind of give some descriptions and some characteristics in that article i was very careful not to name people um for this very reason uh, first of all because I think some of them would disagree with how I would categorize them, but mostly because I think uh, this typological distinction, it, what my concern is a deeper way of, of navigating these basic anthropological principles. That's the thing that I think is uh, um, more important. So these, these differences is a symptom. Uh, these kind of stylistic approaches is a symptom of something that's deeper. It's how we uh, make use and navigate the resources of the Christian intellectual tradition when we use this concept, disability. Now, that's the, that's the key thing here, at least as, as I think about when I, when I think about how this concept has been used when it's reintroduction to discourse in this, since the 1960s, the very concept of disability itself has been framed for us. It's, uh, 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 it's been framed for us in juridical terms. So as a legal concept, it's been framed for us in sociological terms, and it's been framed for us in sociopolitical terms. Now, those ways of framing and using that concept of disability, these get inflected in various kinds of Christian theological work, spiritual memoirs, um, and even sometimes uh, in, uh, um, in, 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 in ecclesial documents. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing. My only, my only, uh, concern as, as a theologian is that we need to pay attention when we're importing these frameworks um, uh, because they can impact how we do our work and how we think about what human dignity 
um, and that's that. I think that's the big concern. Uh, it was, at least that that's my big concern. It, um, yeah. Okay, great. No, that, that's really good because I mean it's clear that you 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 um, are critical of the way your own discipline has you know sort of proceeded, either oblivious to disability as a category, right, or a, you know a, something through which to think, or you know sort of um, you know by just by using it for certain kinds of purposes. Let's. Let's move to another question, which I think is a you know a kind of really um, fair question, uh, given what you both have said about um, disability. And the, the 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 questioner asks essentially, what are we to make of the fact that Jesus is that Jesus heals people? So right, if if we're if we're reluctant to think about disability in the sort of typical disability versus ability typology you talked about um, earlier. What are we to make of the fact that, or, or what does Aquinas make of the fact that that Jesus all heals people of these disabilities? Does that maybe in a way sort of entrench a kind of thinking that you both are resisting? Miguel, do you want, I mean, uh, Paul, do you want to start uh, that, in response to that question? Then Miguel, could you snap maybe after him? Sure, absolutely. Uh, I'd be happy to. Well, um, yeah, that's that's significant. I think uh, that what they do is they is they they prefigure, they telegraph, the um, the liberation and the full fruits of Christ's redemption. That is to say that they look forward to the time when we will be free of all suffering, when we when we will shed no you know there will be no tear that will be shed, which will happen in, in the resurrection. It's important to, to recall though that. Jesus doesn't simply uh, heal everyone, uh, and and um, you know if, if I could uh, just um, uh, um, give a little advertisement for uh, this TV show series, The Chosen, that uh, has um, started last year is currently embarked on season two. They're they, they're kind of exploring this. It's on the life of Christ, and they have actually an apostle with a disability. They they uh, James the Lesser has a disability, and uh, this latest episode, he's they're wondering why he hasn't healed him, <laughs> and uh, you know why is it why is it he heals some and not and not others? Um, so you know it's it's that look um, that this life here below uh, that suffering is the lot of us in this life. Uh, but it's not the end, uh, and and we know it's not the end because uh, because of what Christ promises and what his resurrected prom what his resurrected body promises. Understood, Miguel. Anything? Yeah. I, so I, I I love that question, and I particularly love that question because I know where it comes from. It comes from uh, a very honest reflection from certain uh, um, uh, folks who are informed by. by critical disability theory, they're looking at like, man, is this a judgment, a divine judgment against disabled folks when um, against uh, uh, when, when Jesus takes away the disability, especially when uh, we know that so often this can, uh, a, a person, the condition of their body can form so much of their identity. I mean, they're, I mean, like uh, deaf culture itself, it's built around a particular uh, configuration of the body. Like that, and that's a beautiful and a gift. So I can understand like where that question is coming from. Now, this is what I think is beautiful about what we have in Christian scripture. When, uh, uh, when we begin and we recognize that impairment, illness, and injury or vulnerability to impairment, illness, and injury, that that is not a primeval curse. Um, uh, that it's that our vulnerability is a gift. Uh, it's one of the gifts that's, that will be perfected uh, uh, if we, at least if we follow Aquinas, like what are some of the other things Jesus did? I mean, Jesus fed the 5,000. He raised Lazarus from the dead. Uh, he did all sorts of interesting things like that, right? So when he fed the 5,000, was he making a judgment against work? Was, was that a, like a divine critique of work? When, uh, when, um, when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, was that a, a divine judgment against our uh, our mortality. Well, you know, Lazarus still died, and and those folks that Jesus fed, you know, they still got hungry again. And the people that Jesus healed, they didn't become, uh, you know, superheroes. They didn't. Uh, 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 they weren't uh, 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 eased away from their vulnerability to impairment, illness, and injury. They were still vulnerable people. I'm assuming they were just like all of us. Uh, uh, they still went to the bathroom. They're still susceptible to all kinds of uh, to the world and everything else. And maybe they. God, uh, we're impaired or ill or injured again. What Jesus does in the, we'll just take the example of food and of 
uh, and of the healing. It's like he frees particular persons uh, of, of, of uh, he, he frees them from a limitation for a particular time. And what a wonderful gift. What a, what a grace. Uh, there was a particular, the purpose of the feeding, that's the next question. What is the purpose of feeding the 5,000? What is the purpose of this particular healing? Now you're asking a whole different question about the good news and what God has revealed in and through Jesus. Like, that's a question that belongs to the tradition of the church where we can, where the healing is not about a judgment against disability. It's about recognizing this person, regardless of their impairment, illness, or injury, is part of a bigger story that's unfolding in the redemption of creation as God reconciles all things unto God's self. That, I think, is a more deeply Christian and a more complex view of, uh, of, of those particular uh, passages of scripture. So you mentioned superheroes, uh, and there's a question here um, that relates to something I, I'm completely unaware of. Maybe you guys have heard of this. There's now a contemporary thought that having special needs is a superpower for the person who has it. Um, I don't know if you have ever heard anything like this, guys, but, um, and, and the person asks, how does that fit in with St. Thomas Aquinas' uh, his teaching or our Catholic theology? Have you ever heard of that before? Um, I, I, I think I, I've heard things along those lines, and this is um, how I've encountered that kind of basic idea. Like, th there are certainly, absolutely no question, like, like, uh, uh, through the way my family uh, navigates the impairment, uh, illnesses, and injuries of our lives together um, in our own clumsy way, um, there are there's a certain kind of you could say a, a unique insight that we have into the world as a family um, about what's normal and what's not what not normal. What, what's normal in my life is not what's normal for most people. Uh, uh, and and so like on in that or or like you talk about like deaf culture. Yeah, like, 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 like even within deaf, uh, even, even within deaf culture, like there's something beautiful that, emer that emerges that hearing folks like me that we don't have access to, like that's a wonderful gift. My big concern, and I think this is a concern that comes uh, from, uh, from the gospel, is that I, I don't think it is appropriate for us to create a different economy of grace for folks uh, uh, based on the condition of the body. I think uh, everything about the, the tradition of the church pushes us towards, you know, whether you're uh, able-bodied or, or, uh, or disabled-bodied, um, uh, whether you are strong or weak, um, um, or rich or poor, uh, that these kinds of things, that, that these, are, these are temporary conditions, because on the horizon of life, we're all part of uh, a, a journey that's unfolding and oriented towards our ultimate um, uh, the, the, the ultimate corruption of our bodies. And this is what the promise we have in the resurrection. So superpowers, I think there are certainly special insights and gifts that but pe people have by way of their unique circumstances. And I think those should be treasured and received. Um, and those come in all sorts of ways. And I think that there are folks whose bodies who are impaired and ill, they have gifts to offer the church uh, that uh, need to be received and re-received again and again by every generation. Um, and that takes hard work, especially I think today, because culture, our contemporary culture, uh, this uh, uh, ideology of autonomy, it tunes us in a way where we're not able to recognize um, uh, the gifts of people who are impaired, ill, or injured. Yeah, I would, um, I would, I would agree that it's important not to see people with disabilities as a part, either for good or for for bad. Yeah. Uh, and that that there are differing degrees of impairment of suffering certainly but here's where to give a positive response to the superpower the real superpower is the redemptive power of Christ on the cross that's the real superpower and the greater the suffering the greater the impairment the greater the disability the greater the participation in that power so in in, in that sense one could say that that's great. That's great. Another question um, asks, the church speaks of vocations for all humans and for spe specifically the male and the female when it comes to the vocation of marriage or of authentically living out one's masculinity or femininity. How might living out this vocation change for an individual with a cognitive or developmental disability rather than a physical one? We're thinking just about the cognitive or developmental disabilities. Um, any, any insights into that? Paul, you want to maybe take a well, shot? Well, yeah, I'm, 
I, I think about that a lot, actually. So my son is, is um, he's 16 years old now. And I, you know, I wonder about this because he's not cognitively impaired. Um, and I just, um, his, his physical needs are, are so acute uh, that certainly nothing precludes um, the possibility that, that uh, a woman could fall in love with him and vice versa. Um, you know, but, you know, it's, a, it's going to be a different story, of course, for those with a cognitive impairment, because yeah. marriage, a valid marriage implies consent, free consent, and consent implies the willing uh, commitment to a lifelong union, uh, to, you know, fidelity, sexual fidelity, and, and whatnot. Um, but we have to remember also that, that uh, for circumstantial reasons, many people are unable to to realize this vocation, and it's not it's not any fault of their own. Um, it's for you know it's it's for whatever the circumstantial reason might be. Uh, disability would be would would be one of those. Uh, so I've just as uh, uh, thank you for that. I, on, on the topic of marriage, I will always uh, defer to. To Paul, uh, 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 but what um, among the basic things like in the sacramental guidelines of the U.S. Catholic Conference of Bishops, like it's it's clear if someone can make the promise, it's like the the, the vocation of marriage is open to all people. Uh, 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 you know, but Pope John Paul II actually has some items. Like I don't know the documents off the top of my head, but he does give reference in a couple of his speeches uh, uh, to supporting the vocation of marriage for folks who have impairments, illnesses, and injuries. Um, uh, it's, it's, uh, he sometimes discusses on, on the, under the heading of disability, but even then, like, it, it's not always found under that term and under that category. Well, look, this is, this is great, and, and I want to be respectful of everybody's time. I'm going to take a couple of more questions. We have so many. We're already over our time, and uh, we're, again, we're deeply grateful for uh, the audience for being you know, an active part of this conversation. So let me Take at least a, you know one or two more questions. Uh, this one asks: uh, Would disabled people be like angels among us to give us a way to recognize sacrifice, to be thankful for what we have, and to bring out virtues in the people around, like the the, uh, the disabled, like charity? I had a Down syndrome sibling who passed on as a toddler, and that is how I discerned her disability and her brief life among us. And, uh, this is obviously you know a powerful testimony. Um, right, wrapped around a question. Um, Miguel, do you want to start? Uh, sure. Uh, so first of all, I, I think there's always, um, like, the church has a responsibility to recognize um, uh, the saints that are among us, and uh, that is, uh, that, that's, a, that's a vital work uh, that, that needs to be undertaken. Um, and, you know, the uh, saintliness, holiness uh, is, uh, we are, cultural circumstances can sometimes obscure our vision to certain kinds of sanctity. But, um, that's the first thing. So uh, I, I think there, we need to recognize those saints from the tradition who are impaired, ill, or injured. And we also uh, need to recognize the saints among us who are impaired, ill, and injured, especially the gifts they bring. Now, but one thing, and this is uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the theology teacher in me, I just, want to, just, uh, just to make clear that, that uh, human beings don't become angels. Uh, uh, angels are at least within the, uh, as, as Christians understand it, uh, there are different species of, of, of creature. Um, uh, we are human, we will always be human beings. Um, uh, we, even in the resurrection, uh, it's a resurrection, we believe in the resurrection of the body. Um, that, that's, uh, that's, that's very important that we remember that. But the, I, I, what I took the, the questioner to be pointing towards was towards a, a sanctity, the recognition of saints uh, among us. And, yeah, why not? I mean, we need more saints. Uh, we need more people to show us the way. Just like when it comes to the vocation of marriage, we need more saints. Uh, we need uh, we need folks who have impairments, illnesses, and injuries who are living the vocation of marriage uh, radically and profoundly, who can show us new ways and new paths to, to enter into this, this vocation and, and to enter into the sacrament fully and receive the sacrament fully. Thanks, uh, Miguel, for clarifying the, the bad theology of It's a Wonderful Life. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, let, you know, with respect to this question, I'll just reiterate what I close my remarks with, and that is, I'm really convinced the great saints among us are those with disabilities. Uh, the greater the sharing in 
the cross of Christ, the greater the holiness, the greater the beauty. And I swear to you, when I look at my son, I so often feel like I am beholding the face of God. I really do. I, I, it's, it's, it's palpable that God is, I am on holy ground. And, um, you know, this, this, this is a gift. This is a gift uh, that my son is to our family, to the world, uh, and most especially to himself. Okay, really great stuff. Let's take this one as the last question. And it's, a, it's an excellent question because it asks about the relationship of culture to the way we regard people with ability and with disabilities. Uh, and I know I've noticed in my own life when I've traveled to, as like for instance, Spanish speaking cultures, they have very different attitudes towards these questions than, than we often seem to. This one asks, how is the term quality of life impacted the concept of disability and the view of persons with disabilities within our culture. So it's about the U.S. really, like how we, we view these kinds of questions. Maybe I'll start with you, Paul. Miguel, we'll give you the final word, okay? Yeah, uh, so Miguel stressed the dignity of the human person. And this dignity is not determined by functionality. Uh, we live in a culture that tends to, to, uh, to see personal dignity in terms of functionality. And so if, if one's functionality is impaired, uh, then one's human dignity is, is missing or is partially absent, however you want to put it. Uh, and and it, is, it is imperative that we stress that, that a, a Christian anthropology appreciates the fact that, that our dignity is not determined by some accidental feature of our lives, namely what we can or cannot do. Uh, in terms of functionality, but but by having a body and a soul, doesn't matter doesn't matter how big that body is, doesn't matter the color of that body, doesn't matter the the uh, the impairment of that body or of that soul. To have a, a a human soul and a human body together as a composite unity, you have a human being, and thus all the dignity and and um, and uh, sacred sacred dignity of the human person. Great, thank you, Miguel. Final word. Uh, sure. So on the topic of quality of life, um, uh, that, uh, that that's a phrase that emerged um, from late 20th century um, uh, bioethics, uh, biomedical ethics. And it is not a stretch to say that one of the ongoing deepest and earliest arguments uh, uh, Within biomedical ethics, was uh, uh, the uh, was the, the critique was that biomedical ethics in the late twentieth century is basically uh, as it relates to disability was a concern to figure out a sort of under the conditions under which it was okay to eliminate the life of folks who who were disabled. Um, uh, uh, that's that's one of the common critiques of late twentieth century bioethics, uh, biomedical ethics. Now, I, and I think this is part of. What's important is that like these are critiques that came from folks who uh, who identified as having disabilities. Um, uh, it was a critique that arose from folks who were galvanized because of because of a common and shared identity. And that kind of work needs to be recognized. Um, I, I think uh, as as much as I I love these questions and I'm enga engaging these questions, we need. Uh, more folks who can raise those kinds of critiques within the tradition, within the Christian theological tradition, as, and draw upon resources uh, of St. Thomas Aquinas, folks who have the experience and have the knowledge, uh, the personal intimate knowledge, to uh, to make these kinds of arguments um, in, in a way that's rich and complex and nuanced and cuts against the grain of contemporary culture. Um, I'm really grateful and honored to have been part of this conversation and to offer what I have. Um, but I also look forward to uh, being displaced by folks who have the ex uh, a, a more personal and intimate experience with these realities than I do. My, my experience is deep and personal and intimate. I don't need to go into it, but uh, there are other folks whose experience is even more deep and more rich and complex than mine. And I hope that the next time someone's talking about Aquinas and disability, um, uh, uh, but it'll be someone whose life is informed by disability in a way that's more obvious than mine is. Well, great. Thank you. Look, thank you both so much, Paul and Miguel. This is really wonderful. Our thanks from the IAG to our partners at the National uh, Catholic Partnership for Disability. I want to thank Jenna, Jacek, and Nancy Sullivan, our ASL interpreters. They worked really hard for us tonight. Uh, we went over, um, they're doing overtime. Uh, the, the, you know, without their service, this couldn't have been as rich a conversation either. So from us at the IHE uh, and at the uh, National Catholic Partnership for Disability, 
Thank you all for spending this, uh, this time with us and we look forward to seeing you in the future.